So uh, tonight's meeting will feature a presentation by uh, Lonnie Buenas, uh, followed by our business meeting where we're going to review a couple of open items and discuss the results of the uh, emergency meeting we had last week, as well as some new uh, proposals that have been put on the floor. And we'll talk about some upcoming events that we are looking forward to. The, uh, Earth Day observation, as well as the AAI Astronomy Day in May. So without any delay, uh, Mary Lou, would you like to introduce Lonnie and uh, take it from there? Okay. Um, I don't know, Lonnie and I have been friends for a long, long time, and I really enjoy his sense of humor and his abilities at illustration, as well as his knowledge of astronomy. Um, and so I don't know about this talk at all. I've not heard this one at all, but it just sounded really intriguing. So, <laughs> Lonnie, tell us, tell us what gets on your nerves. What bothers you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mary Lou, for making this possible. I, I promise there's no swearing, there's no cursing, there's no sex or violence. <laughs> um, but, but I thought it'd be a great opportunity for me to get things off my chest. And so I thank you for being a captive audience for a night of straight complaints, straight through. This is gonna be great. I get to complain about all the things that bother me in astronomy and astrophysics, and maybe some of them bother you too. And uh, at the end of the talk, I'd welcome uh, comments, questions, and contributions for what bothers you. So let's try it. I call it, what bothers me? And I, I'm inspired by W.C. Fields. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us may be too young to know who that is, but you know, that's why we have the internet. We can look things up. What bothers do, do, me? Do you, do you smoke a cigar? Uh, no, I don't. No, I've never smoked. Uh, uh, I'm, allergic, I'm actually allergic to cigarette and marijuana smoke. It, uh, it makes my throat close up, my eyes tear. When I was young, my parents took me into a, a, a restaurant that may no longer be there on the Route 1 Circle. Uh, what the heck was the name of that place? And uh, it was a, a cloud of cigarette smoke. Everybody smoked back then. I, I, I couldn't take it. I had to leave. So, ugh! Things that bother me are misnomers. Now, a famous misnomer you all know about is canali, canals of Mars. Just because Chaparelli called them canali was mistranslated as human-made Canals didn't mean that at all. In Italian, canali means grooves. Why, why should we explore space? I've heard this over and over. Why do we explore space? We've got so many problems on Earth. Let's answer that question. Number three, the speed of light. Speed of light, to me, stupid light is just too slow. The moon in movies, this is really irksome. And Star Trek stars of a similar vein. And finally, clouds, everybody's favorite. So we're going to start with misnomers. This is my list. I'll bring it back at the very end, and we'll review the, uh, the reasons. Misnomers. This really bothers me. Theory. People use the word theory to mean all sorts of things that it was never intended to mean. Even scientists and mathematicians do this when they should really be saying the word hypothesis. <laughs> if, if you wanna hear somebody who's very good at this and who consistently mispronounces hypothesis because she's German, check out the videos of Sabina Hassenfelder on YouTube. They're sponsored by Curiosity Stream and other big big proponents of science education, but uh, she calls it hypothesis, theory and hypothesis. And hypothesis is a, 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 an idea put forth with some scientific reasoning, but it's not a theory. Hypothesis has to be tested, and so does a theory. Theory is a formal statement that can be tested, that comes from speculations, hypotheses. And the worst one ever, besides Canali, there's, there's a bunch of others, to me is the word expanding. When cosmologists talk about an expanding universe, 
they're stepping into a, a can of worms. Boy, how's that for a weird analogy? All right, let's break it down. Theory. There's a difference between a mathematical theory, which is a, a, a set of rules and laws set in mathematics, which can be theoretical and it can be tested, it can be proven. Uh, there's um, a, a really good, uh, maybe a good example of an unproven but essential mathematical theory is the Riemann hypothesis. There's a prize for the person who proves this, but it hasn't been done in over a century. There's a difference between a mathematical theory and a scientific theory. And what should be called a, an hypothesis is this, string theory. String theory is not a scientific theory. It's not a scientific theory, it's a mathematical construction. Uh, it has evolved or devolved because there are so many solutions to what they now call M theory or the multiverse, which is vaguely and only loosely connected to M theory. But let's look at that in detail. Here's a list I found of mathematical theories, mathematical theories, right? M theory and string theory are in there. Quantum theory you may have heard of. And then a whole bunch of other number theory, which includes the Riemann hypothesis. And some interesting scientific theories. This is compiled by someone named Lee Sonnigan. <coughs> Pardon me which includes things we've all heard of, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, um, uh, universal law of gravitation, Kepler's laws, all theories, germ theory, cell theory. Zoo theory is misnamed. I actually found the original graduate student uh, paper on this. It's actually called the zoo hypothesis. Anybody familiar with that? Do you know what the zoo hypothesis is? It's, it's been brought up again to answer the question, why haven't we heard from any intelligent civilizations? Now, there are, there's many explanations for this, including the idea that radio communication is, exists only briefly in a technological society because it's crude, it's, it's uh, broad, it, uh, it scatters everywhere. It's not directed like lasers, uh, cell, communication. So it may be obsolete and it may last in a civilization's lifetime only relatively briefly compared to that lifetime. What, what's a century amongst a society that lives for thousands or, or maybe even millions of years? Um, uh, modern humans have been around for only mere thousands of years, tens of thousands. That's very brief in the cosmological time. So that's actually the zoo hypothesis, which is uh, that we're just not interesting enough. And a recent article in ZDNet uh, has the premise that we are just too stupid to be paid attention to so far. I can send you a link for that. Uh, I'll find it. So check that out. Check this out at ungroovygourds.com. Uh, I like Peter Voigt, a mathematician who's working on alternative uh, constructions to explain quantum gravity, gravity at the quantum level, which does not, um, well, there actually is no good quantum theory of gravity yet. Gravity described by relativity theory, general relativity of Einstein, does not jibe with quantum physics. And quantum physics itself, uh, quantum mechanicians will admit to you that it's not a complete, it's not a complete description. It doesn't tell us everything. There are some holes, even though it is a very good description of the universe so far. What we have in the standard theory works very well, but there are missing pieces. So Peter Voigt is uh, one of my favorites, uh, favorite authors. He's uh, written the book, Not Even Wrong. What a great title, Not Even Wrong. Description <laughs> of theory, 10 to the 500th consistent different vacuum states. Pick one, pick any, all right? So there's just too, too many choices for it to be a useful theory to predict anything. And I did hear about a prediction about 10 to 15 years ago, um, a, an actual test of string theory, and I can't find it. I would have found it 
and giving you the link, but I'll still be searching. And that was the idea that because space is quantized in string theory, it would slow down differing frequencies of energy, of electromagnetic radiation at different rates over cosmological distances. And but when they tested that idea, looking at distant sources at different energies, they did not see a difference. So the only test of string theory that I've ever heard of failed. Um, there, there are other tests too, which I'll describe in a moment. But I like um, Voigt's uh, summation, destroys the hope of using the theory to predict anything. That's pretty discouraging. Peter Voigt and uh, physicist Lee Smolin, who's written the book, The Trouble with Physics, it's a classic, have pointed out that a lot of time has been wasted by young mathematicians and particle physicists uh, on string theory. In fact, it's gone nowhere in over 20 years, really. They've, they've not managed to make progress and uh, it's really wasted talents of young physicists who follow the lead of the older physicists who channel them into fields where their energies could be put into something else, like um, the uh, things that uh, Peter Voigt uh, is exploring is quantum loop gravity. Anybody here see the episode of the Big Bang Theory where uh, uh, the, uh, there's a, uh, a conflict between one of the stars, <coughs> um, who, uh, um, Dr. Whoops, um, well, I forgot his name. Uh, there's a actual conflict based on science between a quantum loop theorist and the string theorist. So um, I like Smolin's quote, the real question is not why we've spent so much energy on this, but why they haven't looked at alternatives. And that's what some mathematicians like Peter Voigt are doing. String theory has actually developed into several different branches. There's actually six or more versions that were fairly recently in the past 10 years unified into M theory. There are all different um, perturbations, uh, variants of each other. It's like um, when you have coordinate systems that can be transposed between each other with a, a standard uh, uh, a standard kind of, um, uh, not a perturbation, but uh, wow, I'm losing, I'm, excuse me, as I get older, I lose my vocabulary. But in mathematics, you can change from one coordinate system to another with uh, transformations that bring back the same thing. In a similar way, string theorists have been able to unify these different approaches into one universal approach, M theory. The only problem is that string theory and M theory is, as they admit, incomplete. Incomplete. There's just too many adjustments that you can make depending on initial conditions. Can be 10-dimensional. Oh, sorry, question? What does heterozoic mean? There was some funny word on that last Heterotic, one. heterozoic, yeah. I, oh, he I heterotic, what does that mean? I, I am not really sure, but uh, okay. those... I think those go beyond string theory. Uh, when they include an extra dimension, the bulk is supposed to be an 11th dimension, which would be a large, a fourth large dimension in addition to the three large dimensions that we inhabit. I think that that's what heterotic is referring to because they then embed the tiny wrapped up dimensions, three for each of ours that we see, um, plus time, so that's three times three is nine of space, one of time, and then a bulk would be a large fourth dimension, a large space that the th our three dimensional space with time would fit into. All very complicated. I do not pretend to understand the mathematics. Uh, as a hobby, since I'm retired, I figured I could spend the rest of my life trying to, to figure it out, but I'll need to learn a whole lot of math before that. By the way, since this is rather a small group and rather informal, feel free to interrupt with questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll either make it up or I will admit I don't know something. Uh, I am, after all, an amateur astronomer, so I admit I know hardly anything. 
I did study physics and computer science in, in school, but that was a long time ago. So there may be 10 or 11 dimensions. How do we know? We can't test it. The energies that we re require to test thing, string theory are way beyond us, way beyond even the Large Hadron Collider with its 14 tera electron volts. It's 14 trillion electron volts maximum. The latest test came out at 13, which is incredible. They were uh, the, the Tevatron, the one trillion electron volt collider managed to uh, prove, uh, to find other missing particles like the W particle for the weak force. But they needed the Large Hadron Collider to find the missing piece, the final missing piece, the Higgs boson, which proved that the Higgs field uh, indeed was necessary to complete the standard model. And Peter Higgs, who was one of the originators lived to see it 50 years later, it's incredible, came out with the idea that there must be a field to define mass for all the particles and other fields in 1964. And in 2012, they found the Higgs particle named it for him. He's still alive. The multiverse is another idea. And this irks me that people talk about this so much. Sabina Hassenfelder, who I mentioned earlier, has on YouTube a wonderful explanation of why she thinks this is religion, not science. And that's because something for something to exist scientifically, it has to dis usefully describe existing observations. It has to tell us about something we can observe. And she has several reasons this doesn't work. The, the principle being the simplest assumption is none. You don't need to make up something in order to explain observations. It might be right, but unless you can support it with observations, forget it. The multiverse does not predict the existence of our universe. It's a kind of more of an, a, an idea. Other universes aren't science. You can't observe them. And falsifiable universes are conjectures. But check out the video. Look up the... Um, Universe, uh, if you look up multiverse and religion, you'll find it on YouTube. Very entertaining. All of her videos are under 20 minutes, usually 11 to 19. Some of them are very short and very entertaining. And she's got a great sense of humor. She is a particle physicist, um, brilliant, has come up with a, a great many great ideas. And she's very good in explaining this at a, a lay level to us lay people. So expanding the universe, this really bothers me. The, the use of the term expanding. If we say the universe is expanding as astronomers often do, that implies that it must be expanding into what? Something, right? It's gotta, the word expand means to get larger within something else. A volume gets larger in another volume. Now, if, cosmologists were to explain this by saying the universe is expanding into a, a higher dimension, that would make sense. Just as a balloon has a two-dimensional surface that when inflated expands into a three-dimensional <laughs> volume, right? So we have to look one dimensional higher. This is the idea of the, the expansion since the Big Bang. You've probably seen um, illustration like this before. And even the idea that the universal expansion, which we know is happening, is accelerating, is coming to question. Sabina Hassenfelder, three years ago, put out a video showing that the original studies of supernova to measure this acceleration of expansion were biased in one direction. And we've now found out that our local supercluster of galaxies sits on the edge of a void a vast void that biases the calculations. And so new studies are taking into account more of the volume around us. And around us, by around us, I mean very far from us, not the local supercluster of galaxies. So instead of saying expanding, now a lot of astronomers are saying the, that the space between galaxies is enlarging. It's getting bigger. It's the universe is expanding space. Oops, there I go again. Let's leave out the word. It's like the Monty Python routine. Don't say it. Oops, I said it again. Oops. 
all right, so instead of expanding, they replace that term by saying the distance between galaxies is growing, space is growing, it's, there's making more of space that uh, includes this mysterious dark energy, which uh, maintains its positive uh, influence, its influence against gravity. It's a positive uh, calculation figured out by Einstein in his formula in general relativity. He showed that there must be a factor that causes the universe to expand. There is a tension to the universe worked out with mathematics called tensors. So it's appropriate. But that avoids the, the question, what, what do you mean by growing larger? That's an expansion, isn't it? Well, by studying the cosmic microwave background, often referred to as the CMB, with special satellites like the Planck satellite, we now have an opportunity to uh, measure the shape of the universe, the shape to see if it's open, closed, as it's expanding. And how did they do that? Well, they, we can calculate what the universe should look like if it's flat, if it's closed like a sphere, or if it's open like a hyperboloid. If it's open hotspots in the past, the hotspots uh, the, of the, the tiny fluctuations in energy from the early Big Bang that we can look back to up to 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe became transparent to light. That's the light we're seeing, the earliest light now, finally visible to, to the James Webb Space Telescope. If, if the universe is hyperbolic, hotspots appear smaller than the calculated size. If, they're, if the universe is closed, they appear larger. You can think of this, uh, another way to think of this is if you were to draw a triangle on an expanding closed, spherical universe. We, by reducing the number of dimensions to two, we can visualize this because you and I as human beings can't visualize in four dimensions. So let's bring it down to a two-dimensional universe. Let's say you're a two-dimensional creature living on a two-dimensional universe. You think it goes on forever in a flat plane, but unbeknownst to you, it's curved in the shape of a ball in the third dimension. If you can measure sufficiently far away a triangular shape, you could find that some triangles would not have sides that add up to 180 degrees apart in angle. That's on a flat plane. We know from Euclidean geometry, the sum of the angles in a triangle is always 180. Here's one that's three times 90, 270. If you can measure that tiny variation over the universe, you could prove that way that it's curved. Unfortunately, the universe is probably so big that that angle is gonna be extremely hard to measure. The last measurement did show an indication, the one that I read about, that the universe does seem to be curved very slightly. And the observable universe at 46 and a half billion light years in radius, is exceeded by the actual universe by a factor of several hundred. So just as we inhabit a tiny portion of our galaxy and our galaxy inhabits a tiny portion of the super clusters around it, we are probably somewhere in the outskirts of a vast, vast inobservable universe or unobservable. Inobservable? Unobservable. You like that? Anybody see the, the Simpsons episode where uh, the, the cranky old uh, uh, nuclear facility owner uh, is in the aisle and he looks at catsup, ketchup, catsup, unobservable. So there you have it. Let's, my solution is let's either not say expanding or just say the universe is expanding into a higher dimensional space. It would give us the same viewpoint at any place in that three dimensional universe. Anyone would see galaxies moving away in exactly the same way. Frame independence, which is part of general relativity. So there is a way to unify the physical universe, what we see with general relativity's description of what happens when you travel fast enough to see time and space effects in space-time.
expanding. Don't say expanding. Here's one of my favorites. Why explore space? Why? Why bother? It's too expensive. It's too dangerous. It's too wasteful. Why don't we solve all our social problems first? Well, why don't we take all the money we spend on beer and video games and solve poverty? Hmm? What's in it for me? That's my favorite. Why explore space? Here's an answer. There's a great book. I heartily recommend it. It's old. It's from 1984. Out of the Cradle is uh, written by a, an astronomer who's responsible for the, uh, uh, the first scientific use of crater counts to date surfaces on the moon, Mars, and other bodies. He was in there early when the debate was between volcano, volcanic source or meteor source for, for craters on celestial bodies, way back, 60s. I got to meet William Hartman, great guy. He's also a space artist who was trained by Ron Miller, a space artist. And Pamela Lee has done wonderful illustrations in this book. Out of the Cradle solves the problem of what's in it for us. There are vast resources in the asteroid belt, rare earths that are rare because the Chinese control a lot of those natural resources. And uh, currently our environmental restrictions prevent us from mining those in the ocean. And they are used in your cell phones, in magnets, in electronics, they're used everywhere. Not just rare earths, iron, gold, uh, other elements that are useful to us as we run out of resources on the earth. It's all out there in space. This book described early on by exploring the next frontier is, is vital. It's not only good for our souls, but uh, for our pocketbooks. And I found this under HowStuffWorks.com, 10 Reasons to Explore Space, a really good one uh, that's being put forth now by the National Space Society, of which I am a member, Protection from a Catastrophic, catastrophic Asteroid. And that is a topic for a whole nother talk. There's very good reason to complete the survey of near-Earth objects, NEOs, Check out uh, JPL's site on NEOs, Jet Propulsion Lab. They've been tracking these things and, and now they have a very good catalog of all objects bigger than about 110 meters or so. Actually, they're tracking a lot of these things, smaller and smaller, but they're not complete. They've got about 70% 70 70 of everything a kilometer and up. Would lead to great inventions, good for your health, all right, uh, we might need to colonize space to survive. Um, to, uh, the, um, let's see, the crater on the dark side of the moon, toll, ooh, yeah, and there goes my memory again. Uh, one of the fathers of space flight, the, the Russian, uh, anybody remember? Oh, this is a good test. I'll let the Silkovsky. audience. Silkovsky. Silkovsky, is that who you're thinking of? Silkovsky, thank you. Yeah, there's a crater named for him. Thank you very much. It's my failing memory. Solkovsky, uh, I believe, is one of the ones who said, um, Earth is the cradle of civilization, but we cannot live in the cradle forever. So here's some good reasons to explore space. One of my favorite debates was Dr. Carl Sagan, famous for billions, never said billions and billions, but he did say stars stuff, which we all need. In 1982, he debated Senator William Proxmire, who had a, a program to cut waste. And he was uh, being interviewed. And Proxmire uh, said, why, why do we need to bother exploring space? The stars are, are always going to be there. Come on. And Sagan uh, was quick, very quick when it spun and instantly with, yes, but will we? Oh, and by the way, uh, he um, he won backing for the hunts for uh, the uh, the reasons for exploring space for preventing catastrophes. And Sagan's actually also uh, critically responsible for studies of uh, nuclear explosions that would lead to a nuclear winter. Right? That's really that's way back, early '80s. So. My final complaints are about the speed of light. 
This is how I imagine the speed of light. This is an illustration of Rip Van Winkle before he fell asleep. Light is a sluggard. Look at this. 300,000 meters per second. I mean, that's in one second, light goes only 78% of the way to the moon. That's disgusting. The, um, by the way, the meter standard of length used by the scientific world is based on light now. It's defined exactly as 1,299,792,458 of a second. So here's a problem. This, is, this really bothers me that it takes this long at the speed of light to get to the moon. So there's a delay in communications. To Mars, depending, because Mars sometimes approaches Earth closely every 17, 15 to 17 years, or if it's on the other side of the sun, it can be much further, anywhere from three to 22 minutes. Neptune, over four hours, that's disgusting. How are we supposed to get anywhere? Even if we could travel close to light, Pluto, five hours. Arakoth, the most distant object is visited by human robots, it used to be called Ultima Thule. All right, it was the next object that New Horizons flew by after Pluto a few years later. Six hours, 46 astronomical units at far point. One astronomical unit being the distance from Earth to Sun or Sun to Earth. How about the Oort cloud, where the comets come from? The vast cloud starting from 2,000 astronomical units. Uh, a light year is about 65,000, 66,000. Look at this, 12 days to three years, how are we supposed to get out to the stars? Four years to Alpha Centauri, uh, even at close to the speed of light, you know, a round trip is gonna be like nine years, plus if you spend a year there, 10 years, 10 years on earth, if the, if the astronauts could move quickly enough, a few weeks could go by, but they'd come back and everybody else on earth would be 10 years older. Milky Way Center, up to 28,000 years. Andromeda Galaxy, two and a half million. The Virgo Cluster, closest supercluster, 54 million years to get there. And the Proto Supercluster, Hyperion, 11 billion, 11 billion. The observable universe at 46.5 billion light years. Now, how could the, the observable universe be 46.5 billion light years in radius if the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. How is that possible? Anybody know the answer to this? Well, space is flexible. Space-time, Einstein actually coined a new term, space-time. You have to consider it together. Space-time flexes the universe, when it expanded, actually expanded faster than the speed of light. It did not violate any physical laws, all right? Because Einstein's restriction only applies to the space-time medium within it, not what happens externally. Space can expand perhaps at any speed. And uh, this leads us to, to ask, is it possible to warp space so that we can travel effectively faster than light? It is theoretically possible uh, uh, Alcubierre is one of the first to show theoretically that there's no violation of general relativity, although there are practical limitations because where are you going to get the negative mass to, uh, to run a warp ship? There may be alternate ways to do it. We just don't know. But this is my preference. If we could speed things up a little bit, how about make light? Why couldn't God have made light travel a billion times faster? Why? We get to the Oort cloud in a tenth of a second. We get to the Virgo cluster in 19 days. Get to the end of the universe in just a, a few decades. That'd be great. <sighs> Stupid light. So those are basically my complaints. But I do have uh, one last one. Well, a couple. A couple. Uh, I have a, a severe one. I'll save that for the end. Oh, is there a workaround? Yeah, yeah. If the bulk exists, if we exist in a larger fourth dimension, then something else becomes possible that you've heard of, and that's wormholes. Check out 
this uh, link, if wormholes exist, could we travel through them? Uh, the difficult, difficulty would be holding them open from collapse. But uh, just as uh, I did before, if we restrict our three dimensions down to two, and imagine that we're a poor two-dimensional creature living trapped in this two-dimensional surface here, how could we get here quickly? The long way around, whoops, the long way around would take us on a long journey to here. But if there were a wormhole, we'd be traveling on a two-dimensional surface, which violates nothing, no physical laws, much quicker. And if these two points, the, the front and back of the wormhole were much closer, we could get there almost instantaneously. Also, time passes differently in a wormhole. Very bizarre. If we live, if our three-dimensional or four-dimensional space-time, and if there are, if string theory is right, 11 dimensions exist, and we live in a larger fourth empty dimension, then wormholes are possible, and we could travel faster than light. Um, I have a, a beef to pick with the way Hollywood producers don't consult scientists. They don't even consult you guys, amateur astronomers. They don't ask. They just show the moon in movies. This is one of my favorites. The uh, trip from the Earth to the moon, very early on, very poetic. Oh, this is my favorite moon. But here are some, uh, a list of movies with the moon in the title. Laser Moon, Man in the Moon, Moon over Miami. A Trip to the Moon is the early one from 1902. The problem is that nobody bothers to look at what the moon looks like in the real sky. This is the kind of moon I've seen in several pictures that uh, several science fiction pictures in which the moon appears. You know, what's wrong with this picture? Mare Chrysium, we see that right to the naked eye. Where are the craters? <laughs> yeah, right. Where, and where's the, the other sea? Where's the Sea of Tranquility? Where's Shouldn't there be a lot of black? Where's the man in the moon? Wrong orientation. Yeah, well, also, even worse, wrong side. There is Solkovsky. Oh, sorry, there is Solkovsky. Where? This is the wrong, we never see the side of the moon from Earth. And that's how I've seen it in movies depicting the moon from the Earth. Here's one that got it really wrong. Uh, in Stargate, they go to a planet with multiple moons. Wonderful idea. Interesting. The Earth might have had two moons when our moon was formed. Did you know about this? Yep. Uh, if Thea, a large object, collided with the Earth at a grazing angle, and this has been done in supercomputer simulations, it would have formed a cloud of steam that would have condensed in probably into two objects that then collided. And we see evidence for this. We see evidence for this on the other side of this picture. There's a, oh, actually you can see part of it right here. There's a vast dark area on the side of the moon we can't see where there is a mass under that frozen sea of lava, just like the ones on the near side. That's where the smaller object might've impacted the larger to coalesce into the current moon. And this is, uh, this is all being studied with supercomputer simulations that would not have been possible 20 years ago. Is that the Aiken yeah, so, crater? What's that? Is that the Aiken crater, in the southern part of the moon you're talking about? I think uh, it's not called a crater. It's a, a basin, but uh, you may basin, be Basin, right. rather, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I believe you're right. Thank you. Yeah, so you see the problem. They just took a picture of our moon and said, oh, this planet has three moons. Why couldn't they have just, you know, done a little bit of artwork and made some fanciful moons? This is really irritating. Did any movie get it right? Yes. And you know this one. Everybody shy out there? Anybody know which one this is? It's E.T. E.T. Yep. Very good. So once in a while, people get it right. Uh, I have a beef to pick with Star Trek. Uh, I know it's it's giving you the idea of rapid travel through space to see stars streaking by, but let's take a look at this. The galaxy, the visible portion of our galaxy is roughly 100,000 light years end to end, maybe a little more. Uh, it does have dark matter on the outskirts that brings it to much bigger, but the part that we see with visible light is on the order of 100,000 light years. We're gonna use some round numbers. 
right? Also, this is a recent map that shows the galaxy is not flat. The galaxy disk is not flat, it's warped, probably because of collisions with other dwarf galaxies like uh, the two that you can see from, from the Southern Hemisphere. Anybody out there ever been uh, below the equator? I have not. The I've large and seen... small Magellanic uh, clouds. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I have, I'm, myself, I've never seen the Magellanic clouds, except in Stellarium, in Celestia, in star maps, but uh, not the real things. I'd love to see those. Those have been proven to have collided going right through our galaxy eons ago, warping it and uh, probably a leftover collision from another large galaxy. We, we are headed for a collision with the Andromeda galaxy, but never fear, I understand they've pushed it back. It's no longer 3 billion years, it's five. Boy, wow, I'm relieved. It's about 5 billion years and the whole dance, it's gonna take over a billion years to settle down when the centers of both galaxies will create a supermassive black hole that combines both in the centers of each. But if you look at the uh, Star Trek, uh, the later versions, see stars streaking by. If we um, say uh, the stars, the average distance between stars in this neck of the woods is about 10 light years. So it might be a little more. The nearest uh, sun-like stars to our sun range from four to 47 light years away. So let's round off, say 10. In this uh, image, we can guesstimate that a star flies by in 10 light years in about a second. 10 light years per second. Now, 100,000 light years divided by 10 is 10,000 seconds. 10,000 seconds to traverse the galaxy. A day is 86,400 seconds. So it would be a few hours to traverse the entire galaxy. In Star Trek Voyager, it takes them 40 years or would have taken them 40 years had they not found a shortcut. Oh, spoiler alert, sorry, in case you haven't seen it. So it's taking them so long to get back to Earth when they end up in a distant quadrant by accident. But if they're traveling this fast, they'd get back there in less than a day. So I wish they would have done proper calculations. There is a site, NRAO, a National Radio Astronomy Organization, that asks, what's the average distance between stars in our galaxy? Go, so go check that out. And in Reddit, why is warp speed so full of stars? I love that. So go query that, that's fun. Finally, to wrap things up and there'll be plenty of time for questions, uh, I, I want to complain about my nemesis because I went out, I went out the, um, one of, your, uh, one of the other astronomical societies in the state of New Jersey recently had a comet watch for the green comet Zipf. That's what I call it, Zipf. And uh, we looked in the sky, we saw planets, we saw Mars, it was great. We saw some things, it was a bit of haze in the sky. Uh, but when we looked to the north where the comet was by the Big Dipper, that's where the haze was. Oh, oh. so all I have to say for clouds is this. <laughs> and that, my friends, is what bothers me. Let's use hypothesis when people say theory, when it isn't a theory. Let's not say expanding universe if astronomers insist that it's not expanding into anything, it's just expanding. Don't use the word expanding, say something else. Make up a word, it's flabularizing. The universe is, as Carl Sagan would have said, the universe is vast and flabularizing. Why explore space? Why not? Human beings are explorers. You can't hold this back. Uh, there, there may be a vast majority of us who don't care. But there's always going to be human beings who want to push the boundaries. And there's stuff in it for us. There's resources out there. There is, at the very least, there's iron, there's diamonds, right? They both, some people believe that because Phobos, the moon of Mars is carbonaceous chondrite and it impacted at a high rate to, to be blasted off of Mars, that its core may be diamonds. We might find diamonds on Phobos or rare earths that we need for a technological civilization that depends on magnets, powerful magnets and cell phones. My God, what would we do without cell phones? The speed of light is too slow. 
There, I've said it. And the moon, the moon in movies is wrong. It's wrong. Uh, my wife hates it when we go to a movie and I see the moon and I start muttering under my breath. It's worse than that woman next to us with the candy wrapper. I swear, the last time we were in the movies, a woman sat there unwrapping some candy for five minutes, five minutes. It doesn't take me five minutes to unwrap a piece of candy. I almost stood up and went over. I started to get up to offer my assistance. And my wife just pushed me down as hard as she could. And finally, Star Trek stars are just too fast. Let's get it right. Of course, if they did that, the stars would be, as we say in the scientific terminology, boring. So I guess you have to take artistic license. And finally, the thing that really bothers me in astronomy is ugh, clouds. Thank you, you've been a good audience. <laughs> you, can get, you can reach me at uh, my email. Uh, my websites are uh, astronomyinmotion.com. And I have a new one, Mars at Your Fingertips, lets you explore a three-dimensional model of Mars and click on hotspots to bring up snappy videos narrated by my wife, who I haven't paid. Any questions? Uh, yes. My question, okay, is this goes back to the multiverse um, concept. Which I'm trying to understand, okay, in theory, the multiverse, are they saying that there are other universes that go on inf infinitely or just other um, universes that go on to a finite point? That, that's a very good question. The multiverse idea, uh, one of them, is that <laughs> we live in a, a space that generates at random intervals, evidently, from tiny fluctuations in the quantum vacuum, whole universes, which may have values of the physical constants different from us. And so in many of these universes, atoms <laughs> and advanced life that is self-aware and asks the question, where do we come from, cannot evolve. So perhaps our universe is one of many and one of the few in which, which does have intelligent life. They did a recent study that changed the values of some of the physical constants, including the weak force, and found that there, that there is some leeway where there's a, a, a variation in the values that would allow atoms to form. But the multiverse idea is that these <laughs> universes evolve, grow, evaporate like ours over and over. The problem is we can never directly interact with them. There's no way to measure them, no way to interact. They're trying to think of clever ways that we could attain information from an indication of them from the cosmic microwave background, which we can access. But as far as it being a real science, Sabina Hostenfelder calls it uh, a religion. <laughs> Bonnie, great job. Oh, thank you very much. You're yeah, question. I have, I have one question. Do you, do oh. you have any pet peeves about the uh, aliens and visitation and all of that? Well, you know, uh, I, do, I do have one and that is, um, the um, the astronomer Marjorie Fish did a scientific study of the Betty and Barney Hill incident in the 60s in which they claimed to have been abducted, abducted by aliens, hypnotized, uh, may have, uh, may have, having been made to have their memories wiped, but it was not successful. And under hypnosis, Betty Hill revealed a star map that uh, matches a pattern of nearby stars. Now, Carl Sagan and a graduate student wrote a paper which debunked this by showing you could take any arbitrary group of stars and make up any pattern. But Marjorie Fish debunked this by picking only stars that are favorable to form planets like the Earth's sun. She picked solar stars of a particular age, slow rotators, something that was convenient to travel between in a starship. And there does happen to be a ring of such stars, solar stars, about two dozen of them, they're visible only from the Southern Hemisphere. They include Tau Ceti, Alpha Centauri, and the stars that the aliens seem to have come from is a double star system, Zeta Reticuli. And the star map shows two stars close together in the foreground, a bunch of other stars that line up very nicely if you use only the solar stars. So there is potential proof that we were visited by aliens in the 60s. And an additional proof, the star map that proves it, the Gleesey catalog, did not exist at the time of the abduction. It came later, and the Gleesey catalog was the first accurate 
assessment of the distances of these stars. So in that case, I think um, we have proof of a visitation, but scientifically we can't prove it. I, I, I happen to believe that we're not special, that the processes that made us, that made DNA are everywhere, everywhere in the universe. And we could have as many as 10 billion intelligent civilizations in our galaxy alone, but at different levels of technological advancement from cave people to, I don't know, a civil, what would a civilization that's been around for a million years be like? We have technology, high technology for only a century. Can you imagine if we'd been around a million years, what, what could we do? Would we have warp drive? Would we attain, would we be a type two civilization using the entire energies of our sun? I don't know. Interesting speculations. Mm -hmm. But that, Chris, that's a very good question. And I, I can only, I can only say there's no way to scientifically prove alien visitations. You have to look at all the cases of UFOs at the Benny and Barney Hill incident. I'm reading a book right now called um, uh, Shoot Them Down, the 1952 air wars with UFOs. And the guy is, uh, sounds like a crackpot, but he absolutely details every single incident in that book. And it's fascinating some of the things people have seen I don't know, in 1952, I don't know how they could have seen some of the things that looked technological back then. To me, it seems like drones, like modern drones, but not in 1952, which by the way, is the year I was born. Good question. Mary Lou. So I have something um, that's just tangentially related to what you were talking about, <clears throat> about the speed of light and the fact that Pluto is uh, almost five hours light speed away from us, uh, a little less than that. So when we sent spacecraft out in the last century, um, like Pioneer and Voyager, they went past the distance to Pluto and are now far, far beyond that. But <clears throat> once they got out past uh, whatever planets they could see easily, they were um, put on a, on a very um, low level of energy. And what they did was that somebody at JPL would press a button in the morning and send out a signal that says, uh, how are you doing today? What's the temperature? What's the magnetic field? Um, what, what sort of things have you uh, experienced today? All right, what's the battery power? And then the machine would get the, that notice, uh, figure out what the numbers were and send the notice back by radio waves. And then somebody at JPL would just get it and write it down, log it. Um, and I, I remember the time when that went from a, a one shift person to how they had to have two shift persons so that somebody would press the button in the morning. Eight hours later, the signal had still not come back. And so the person on the next shift had to take the answer. Yeah, that's incredible. The distances involved, we tend to forget how slow light is. And so uh, communication, I've written a, a science fiction novel that depends heavily on communication at the edge of the Kuiper belt, about 154 astronomical units out. And every chapter in my book had to dovetail to the events on earth happening with the signals coming from that distance. At one point, the AI tells his, his human companion, alien actually, yeah, we have to wait 21 hours and 21 minutes for the return signal. So it all has to, it's, the science has to be right because science fiction fans will pick your brain apart if you make a mistake. <laughs> Have you sold this book? Can we go buy it? No, not yet, not yet. I've had four rejections and I'm only getting started. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. I, I have a friend who says uh, for every, he gets one acceptance for every 10 rejections. So much. You gotta keep at it. <laughs> So what bothers you guys about astronomy and, and physics? Well, I, I can tell you a, a lot of times, um, like you said about getting the moon wrong. Uh, for instance, there were many years, uh, one, I can pick one show out. One, you will see uh, the wrong phase of the moon for the wrong time of night. It could be, you know, something will be depicted at, midnight and it's a crescent moon uh and it's it's in the wrong it's facing the wrong direction you know it's in the wrong orientation um matter of fact i think even jimmy kimmel when he started out he had the moon facing the wrong way wrong time of night 
and I think they fixed it. I think Neil deGrasse Tyson came on and yelled at him oh, once, and then like the next de- <laughs> next episode, it was. <laughs> you know, it's so easy. It's so easy to call call an observatory, call a planetarium, call Mary Lou. Jeez, there's so many people who <laughs> could help. And, and comic strips often get the moon wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not that hard to fix, really. You know, that's the thing. In Star Trek, one of the Star Trek movies, they they take a trip to Titan, the moon of Saturn, which orbits only a 1.3 degree tilt, and they show the rings wide open. Now, is it possible? My question is: Is it possible to be scientifically accurate and also entertaining? As a space artist, <coughs> I would say yes. It's easy. It's easy to do that. Pick your pick your subject. Pick your composition. Check with an artist, check with a, a scientist, but nobody does. And the, the American Academy of Sciences has a person on staff that is uh, tasked with interacting with um, not just media, but with entertainment. And so people call her uh, with questions like this nowadays. Yes, yeah, so there's a, a special person in charge of that sort of thing. Mary? Yeah. Um, mine isn't so much exactly with astronomy and physics. It's more with the media that I don't think it gives enough attention to the to science. We get an awful lot of information about like the Oscars the other night, you know, on the, on, it's a lot about the entertainment industry. I think we need more press about science. I agree. And they, the sources are I don't think the sources of information are hard to find. I yeah. guess they just don't want to make the effort. Yeah. Hmm. You know, like you know, you'll see they'll they'll mention astronomical events on like weather forecasts, or you know, sometimes you'll see it on the news. Um, but it's not always, you know, it's often not always accurate. You know. Um, oh, I had a. I had an interview with a newspaper once, and I carefully explained the difference between a meteoroid in space, like an asteroid, a meteoroid entering the atmosphere, meteor landing on the ground, meteorite. The next two days later, the article came out completely wrong. They, uh, the guy took notes. I, I don't know. I guess he took notes, but didn't check. Could have mixed them up. You never know. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Dyslexia. <laughs> So here's what? one, Lonnie, I want to get your, your take on, and I've been guilty of this one myself. You often hear about the planet Saturn. If you could build a bathtub large enough, Saturn would float. True or false? Yeah, you know, and I, the way, and I just, I gave a lesson to one of my wife's students on Saturn just a few days ago. And I read, you know, from the, the children's uh, book that they were using, uh, if you could find an ocean big enough, Saturn would float in it. But of course, you'd <laughs> you'd have to find a world big enough, and uh, that's not going to happen. But Saturn's density—it's it's hard for people to picture what density means. I think so. Comparing Saturn that way, uh, maybe it would be better to say if you could shrink Saturn to the size of a beach ball, it would float in Earth's oceans or in a bathtub. Yeah, how about that? because the density is less than the density of water. But I guess, you know what would be better, Dave, is if maybe if we explain density first and then get into the more difficult concept. I saw uh, an, an astrophysicist once talking about a quark star, the first discovered quark star, but he led up, he spent 40 minutes leading up to what quarks were, how stars worked, how stars evolved, and really a beautifully lucid, explanation for lay people. This was um, a talk at uh, AAI. And at the very end, he showed the evidence that his team collected to show that this star, this very compact object might be a quark star. So he did it right, but it took him 40 minutes to get to that point. So maybe we just don't have the patience to say, here's, here's density, you have a volume, it's made of a certain amount of stuff that has a mass, weighs, et cetera, et cetera. I, I guess it takes patience. One thing I find is that, and this is my pet peeve, is that a, a lot of people, and I hear this in everyday conversation, they really don't have a, a, 
an understanding of what a light year is. They think of it, it's a measure of time when it's really a measure of a distance. I hear all like, for example, oh, it took them a, a light year to get here. <laughs> and sometimes I explain that light years a measure of distance equal to approximately 5.878 trillion miles. And they go, oh, wow. Then it blows their mind. Yeah, that, that's very good, Thomas. Yeah, and, and my favorite was uh, in the Star Trek episode, The Dolman of Elas. Uh, tells Kirk, I wouldn't marry you or what have you if you it was a million light years. And she really meant time, not space, hmm. not distance. Yeah, it's a it's a very common mistake. So I try to, in, when I used to work in planetariums, I would tell my young audience what a light year is and what it intends to measure. You know, it's like AU, you know, m miles after thousands of miles, it kind of becomes useless. You know, even the moon is hard to picture at a quarter million. Right. So, you know, we, we go to AU, we go to light years. Um, yeah, we need yardsticks. Parsecs, right. same problem. Parsecs, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think is, I mean, and, and one light year has 63,240 AU, which just goes to show just how much that light year en encompasses in distance. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, the Oort cloud's really out there. It extends way out, way out, very weak very weak influence of the sun's gravity. So stuff falls in occasionally, long period comets. It's really, you know, the universe is just, it's so strange on a subatomic level. And that strangeness just keeps going up no matter what scale you look at. It is a strange universe. Uh, oh, right yeah. on up to those big voids and the super clusters of galaxies. And it's a wonderful time to be alive to see, to see changes in our understanding. When I was young, we didn't know what any satellite looked like. We didn't know what an asteroid looked like up close. We thought that uh, that there was plant life on Mars that changed color with the seasons. We we had no idea about extraterrestrial planets. Boy, you know, come a long way. Yeah. Oh, back then I could count all, I could name almost all the moons of the solar system. Now forget it. Jupiter just got 12 more. Now it's up to 92. It's in a race with Saturn. I think Saturn's gonna beat it eventually. <laughs> collecting, <laughs> collecting potatoes. Yeah, yeah, right, man. If you count all the uh, the moonlets in the rings, forget it. It's thousands. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think the one thing that I maybe maybe I would say angers me more than anything else is uh, when I tell people that you know oh, I'm I'm an amateur astronomer, they automatically go, you know, "Oh, what sign are you?" Oh dear. <laughs> they mix up astrology with astronomy all the time. And yep. and I get that even in, in public telescope nights, that the um, usually the person after that is at, at will ask me, have I seen aliens through the telescope? <laughs> well, just say yes. Just say, yeah, just, I know. Yeah, just say yeah. Oh, yeah, the other night. Yeah. yeah. They had big eyes and right. And yeah, and no, these and these two individuals are almost always like right after the, each other. The, the person that asks about aliens is either before or asked after the person that asks about astrology. It's, 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 you know, it's, I, I got to meet the, uh, the author, um, um, Isaac Asimov, and he was, he was a real uh, colorful character. He once described how he was invited to go on a show to debate astrologers. And he said, he's all gone. Oh yeah. I'll go. I'll, I'll, I'll blast them to smithereens, I'll tear them apart. So he goes and he looks up his sign and it's the old sea goat. And so he said, he tells his wife, I'm not going on any show where they're gonna call me a goat and he refused to debate them. But that happens to be my sign as well. December, <laughs> Capricornus mm -hmm. is the goat, the sea goat. The only problem is the sun is in Sagittarius in December because of precession. Mm -hmm. So it's all wrong. Yeah, right. You know, Mark, when they, they ask you if you're looking at aliens with your telescope, you could say, probably yes, and you won't be wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, especially if I have Europa in, in the eyepiece or something along those lines. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm surface. a firm believer that we're going to find advanced life under the mm -hmm. surface of Europa. And by advanced, I mean more than just microbes. Not people, right. but maybe more than microbes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, it might be. Questions? Oh, sorry, Mark. No, go ahead. No, that's fine. It's not important. Okay. 
I was just thinking we'd wrap up and move on to the next stage. Lonnie, thank you very much. It was thank you. Very well done. Entertaining and yeah. informative. Really okay, nice. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. I gotta go. Okay. Take care, Lonnie. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Thank Mary Lou. Yeah. So, uh, Mark, you want to launch the PowerPoint? We'll get the business meeting started. Yeah. You need a